another nose manage. I got the butt between my teeth. You know, I really stood up and was counted and said, this is not getting away. I remember when we pulled on our helmets and, and Donald says to me, what are we doing? I said, we're going for gold, Barrett. <laughs> Crunching Gears, Season 3, Episode 5. We're back after a short break, and I'm delighted this evening to welcome along Adam Platt. Adam, you're very welcome. Kevin, thanks for having me. No bother at all. So, Adam, I suppose we, a lot of us will know you from, you know, working on Declan Boyle's car, Patrick O'Brien's car and all, but you have a fascinating bike story there as well. How did you get involved in rallying really in the first place? Um, I guess it kind of started from when I was, I don't know, five to ten years old, just going to the service park and that with my dad at the time. He used to um, look after his friend's Mac to escort. Mm-hmm. So I used to go there and he had a 2.1 Pinto. I'd always be passing them the spanners and that. And then over the years, it just progressed. You know, I would learn more and more. And eventually I was the one under the car spanner checking it and just kind of went from there, you know. So I've mm-hmm. always kind of been from a young age, as far back as I remember, just in a service park doing something or rally cars or tinkering at home. Mm-hmm. Just went on from there, really. Yeah. And you're a Cork man originally, is it? I think? Yeah, Cork originally, West Cork, yeah. Yes. So um, Can I West Cork it? rally would have been the, the big one at the time. Yeah. You know? uh-huh. yeah, not far from the ring stage, probably four or five miles from the ring stage. Mm-hmm. Um. That would have always been my aim to do the West Cork Rally myself. And later on, I did get to do it. I've done it, I've done it two or three times now and done the West Cork Rally, but never really had much luck. Didn't have, you know, yourself the best of budgets at the time. And yes. trying to late nights in the garage, trying to get the car ready before. And that. Mm-hmm. You know, I finally got to do it a couple of times. And uh, yeah, the, um, I don't know, strange to do it after all them years. But yeah, I would still know the ring stage by the back of my hand. It would still be. My home rally, I would class it, even though I'm living, mm-hmm. you know, the other end of the country now. So yes. Mm-hmm. So like you know, you've won from the the young guy growing up in the servant park. How did you make the, the move then to the like, M Sport? Like, that was your your more or less. That's what you want from just your ordinary day to day job to to a work yeah. team. Yeah. Um. Actually, went after after school. I went into uh, panel beating and spray painting. I did an apprenticeship in that. Um, just nine to five job done that for 10 years I got up to be the foreman of the workshop in there you know just a regular job did a lot of rally car kind of work in the workshop um, a lot of resprays and stuff like that so then got to know a few more of the rally drivers and bought a few rally drivers in from knowing them from you know just you always know your local your local club members and that and I started fixing tidying rally cars up at home then it's a bit of a spray booth at home and stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, if people often had small bits of damage, they'd come and I'd paint the car for them. And I was doing it from home, you know, in the evenings after work. Um, just kind of stuck in a rough panel beating. Uh, Dad, you know, he knew I really wanted to do um, cars, rally cars full time. You know, I was just kind of, you know, just doing road cars. And I was just getting kind of sick of it at the time. So okay. That actually applied for me to go to M-Sport without me knowing. Um, just just texted me one day and uh, he said I had a phone call today and I said what do you mean and he goes phone call from M Sport and I was like right okay I didn't really know what it was all about he said they want you to go over for um, a trial and I said right how, how's this coming about I didn't know anything of it at the time but he um, without me knowing he did, he'd applied and he had literally got, uh, you know, thanks very much. We'll take it into consideration, let her back. Uh-huh. You know, but he he told me a few times he'd give it a couple of months. He'd send him another email, another couple of months, send him another email. It was just persistent. Yes. You know, and later on, I found out once I got into M-Sport, that they took me over on a trial just to kind of get rid of me as such, you know, to <laughs> stop my dad emailing them. So, you know, I went over in... Um, End of 2012, beginning 2013 for a trial. I uh, did like three days there building the, the R5 car. I'd just come out the Mark 1 uh-huh. Chaser R5. Yes. So I was working on building them. And um, then I would say by the Thursday morning, 
I was in Mads Osberg's car going up to Kirk Ride where they do the shakedown to practice changing gearbox and differentials. Um, I just kind of really got lucky there. But I worked real hard that week and because of my panel beating background, it couldn't have worked out any nicer for me really because uh, one of the first jobs I got given was hit the sills on the, on the Fiesta and I'd done it fairly quick, all lined up and everything. So then he said, have a go with this was the guy who was over me. He said, have a go with fitting the back bumper on that car. And this was like the first of them, they just kind of developed the car so the back bumper didn't really fit, you know, uh-huh. snug, it was fiberglass and that. So I put it on and I was like, geez, it's just not good enough. It's sticking out from the quarter panels. So I says, mind if I ever go with uh, trying to make it fit better? And he says, no, work away. So got a trestle out, got a ratchet strap around it, got a gun on it, managed to actually bend it into the shape I needed it. Kind of left for a while with the heat, let it cool, put it back on, fit it perfectly. So they said they'd never seen one so good. <laughs> no, just so uh, the next day uh, before I was in Mads Osberg's car, sitting going up the road to check gearbox and differentials, and yes, kind of went from there really. Uh-huh. Um, by the Friday morning, I was back on the plane, flying back home to tell my dad I'd got the job. Brilliant, <laughs> unbelievable, wasn't it? Just such a you know, the, yeah, 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 more or less the sort of. Keep your dad quiet. They give him, a, give you a trial, and then boom, exactly, you've got yeah. the job. You know, so yeah, yeah. And, uh, and because of my panel beating background, you know, yeah, it's, it really stood out when I got there. It made you know my job that I was doing on the R5 car really suited my trade. So yes, at the time I was fully qualified in that, uh-huh. and they were kind of expecting this young lad to come in, not have a clue. But you know, uh-huh. I already had a toolbox set up. I had everything I needed. I rocked up, you know, on, it was on time. I even actually stayed back the nights on my trial. I used to go around the workshop and ask any of the mechanics if they needed a hand at night because I was just staying in a B&B down the road. Yeah, you're you going to just pick a bike set and do that. What am I going to do sitting in Cumbria, you know, till 8 mm-hmm. o'clock at night in the B&B by myself, you know? Yes. Mm-hmm. I stayed, I think I stayed nearly every night on my trial and fitted lamp pods to cars and, you know, but... It was all kind of stuff that my panel beating trade really suited, mm-hmm. you know. So I impressed a few people there, which was uh, just worked mm-hmm. out nicely for me. And yeah. that was it. I was back home to tell the boss that <laughs> I was going to work my four weeks notice and disappear off to England. <laughs> so just shipped my whole life off over there. Yeah, and the, was was that was that at the time a dream come true for you? Like you know, you you were saying there you were yeah, starting yeah. to up doing what you were doing. Yeah, yeah. And don't get me wrong, I did love my job. I loved what I did. You know, I was painting some real top end cars, painted, you know, anything from Ferraris to motorbikes, you know, did a motorbike for John McGuinness, done a lot of real nice stuff, you know. Right. Um I really took pride in the painting side of things. Mm-hmm. So um yeah, but like you grow up thinking this untouchable M Sport, you know, World Rally team, you know, watched it on TV all my life. And, Excellent there stuff in the middle of it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and that was a really exciting time for them, you know, this new customer car, the R5 Fiesta. Like that was yeah. the start of what become known, you know, like M Sport was, yes, it was the works team, but they were producing probably, you know, the, the handful of world cars at that time. But this was opening up a whole new avenue for them, really, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, it was a. Uh... Probably a car at the time was half the price of a new world rally car, mm-hmm. and it appealed to a lot more people around the world. You know, and the regulations were kind of changing; they're making it more customer friendly, more affordable for people. Even though for a lot of people it still wasn't affordable, but you know they, they were able to produce two hundred and fifty or even more, nearly closer to three hundred of the Mark One car. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I worked on car number five. I worked back again on car number eight. And that was when we were building them from scratch. And then like, the first few were still in the workshop, hadn't even gone out to customers yet. Mm-hmm. But um, I got kind of spotted and for the customer team, which was WRC. So I went straight over to them. So I kind of bypassed the R5 build stage. Okay. Um, probably because I was a little bit older than the lads. They tried to keep the younger lads towards the build to kind of train them up. Okay. So I was lucky enough that I was able to go straight on to the customer side of things. So. Within, I did that few more years uh, under your belt as such. Yeah, that's still, so. yeah, yeah. I was a little bit later coming in, so I had a little bit more experience. Mm-hmm. So I was straight away into testing for the WRC car. So straight off the G test, you know, within a few months of working there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, it was good, but 
at that time, you know, even the world car side, the whole side of the workshop on the left hand side, I don't know if you've ever seen the workshop, but no. it's just loads of bays. You were talking, I don't know, 16 World Rally or RRC cars on the right hand side of the work or on the left hand side. Uh -huh. On the right hand side was the R5. Yeah. But now it's kind of the opposite way around. There's very few WRCs and mostly R5s. R5s. Uh -huh. At that time, there was a lot of customers renting and they'd done the RRC car. Yes. which was like a WRC car, basically, with an R5 rear wing and a smaller restrictor, uh -huh. and then uh, competed in WRC2 at the time. Yes. So uh -huh. I was kind of work straight on working with them. Uh -huh. So I worked with lots of different variety of drivers there because every week you'd have a different customer in your car. Okay. So it was also very handy to get to know a lot of people uh -huh. you know, and work with a lot of drivers that I still talk to today, but it was because of that experience that... I was working with multiple drivers, you know. Yeah, I, you weren't just channeled to one person that was, as you say, exactly, yeah. you, you know, you had so many. You, you mentioned Nick uh, Henning Solberg, uh, yeah. let's see, mm -hmm. Nick, Nicholas uh, Fuez, uh, uh, even Kelly and Duffy there. With the, uh, the yeah, people, yeah. Uh, I can't I, that's, I, that's to know uh, Killian. That, 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 that was the first time I had my, my first encounter with Killian, yeah. I uh, uh -huh. met him. He was sitting uh Abdulaziz Al Kawari. That's the one that's RRC. <laughs> yeah. In an RRC car. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um I worked with Benito Guerra that year, you know, Mexican driver. I got to look after his car in Mexico, which was just, you know, he was the home hero. Oh, yeah. First yeah. time in Mexico looking after the home hero. You know, I think he was actually running third overall for the first half of the event anyway. I can't uh -huh. even remember what happened after that, but yeah. Um. Yeah, he was. It was a good atmosphere out there with the, looking after the local hero. Uh -huh. You know. Yes. Um. Yeah. Don Henning in 2014 Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian Buffet. You know. Um. Just so many of them. Yeah. And the, the 2000, 2014 Buffet had a fantastic result. Was that the year you finished yes. second? Yeah. Uh, second overall. Yeah. yeah. Um. I think it was. Uh, yeah, it was OJ. OJ won the rally. Uh -huh. yeah. um, but we led, we led the rally until I think it must have been Saturday afternoon until OJ got ahead of him. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, I was working on the rear left corner. I remember it, and one of the mechanics actually on the car still works with me now on Declan's car. But, right. Um, no, we were just thrown into the deep end, and we were leading a WRC event straight away. Uh -huh. which was good and then yeah. he finally he finished second overall yeah but, uh, no that was a good experience he was a good driver yeah. uh -huh. and like for you personally too like that must have given you some buzz too never mind you know like all the all these yeah. years leading up to it and all of a sudden then you're leading monte carlo rally that's i you know, have to be honest when i was in monte carlo i was uh you know it was minus three <laughs> we were just <laughs> working all working all night the rain was sideways it was Ridiculous. Uh, I was thinking, I don't know, is this for me? <laughs> At the time, it worked out good in the end, but yeah. no, we worked. That, that that first Monte Carlo it was back in the day when we used to move the service park during the night. Okay. So I think we had, um, we had a real late service on the Friday night, mm -hmm. then early service Saturday morning, and then long day Saturday, and then on the Saturday night it was raining, service about five o'clock, so you'd service two cars. Uh -huh. 245 plexi services and then you'd have to pack up the whole service park drive four four hours in a truck down to uh, Monte Carlo itself from Gap and then yeah. set it all back up again for <laughs> eight o'clock the next morning for the yeah. cars to come back in all right. for a 15 minute service or something yes so it's not all glamour and glitz in <laughs> No, no, straight away I saw the full reality of, you know, it's not all what you see on TV, but no, uh -huh. no uh, we came away with second and that was some achievement and then straight into Sweden then, which was another cold one, but uh -huh. as soon as you get to Mexico then and you feel that sun in the morning and it's just uh -huh. unbelievable experience there, then. Mm -hmm. get to see a bit more of the world and it's sure. all very good. And do, do you get a chance to like, look at the sites when you're there too, like, you know, after the event, you know, do you um, stay on a couple of days sometimes or, you know, the lakes yeah, of Mexico, yeah, did you go um, and explore? Yeah, you wouldn't see that much, to be honest, Kevin. Um, you would see a lot more if you were on the recce team, maybe. Okay. You know, the I usually was on set up or looking after a car, so okay. recce was, I only got to do a few recce's. Okay. Um, but no, if you're on the recce team, you get to obviously drive all the stages, see all mm -hmm. the towns. 
And I've seen a good bit of Mexico on that way to take the car to. If you're on the customer side, you take the car to a remote shakedown usually or a remote test on the, the Tuesday before the rally. Mm-hmm. So usually we drive the cars out of uh, out of the city. I was going out at the time and drive out into the country. And, yeah. you know, you could drive 10 minutes and it's just back and beyond. You wouldn't. Like these people have never seen a world rally car. Oh, you yeah. ever seen a car, never mind a world rally car. Uh-huh. But just absolute poverty. You just some of the sights, you know, yes. stray dogs everywhere. You would and never then, think it's ten minutes from a city. You know? No, the your idea this your necessity like it's probably you know as good as Dublin, yeah. London, or whatever, and then yeah, yeah. Oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. You know, we're staying in a holiday inn. There's plenty <laughs> big shops, you know, you can get a Starbucks on the way to the service yeah. park in the morning, <laughs> yeah. ten minutes away. You would think you were in third world. Jeez. Unbelievable. But yeah, you get to see some sites. Uh-huh. Um, the likes of Australia and that's you'd often, you know, end of the season. So we would often book, you know, delay our flights home a week. M's were very good that way. So, okay. you know, have a week in Sydney, have a week up uh-huh. the um, Gold Coast. You know, okay. Cairns have done, done all them. So all right, yeah. I'll see a good bit of the world. Don't get me wrong, but I've seen a lot of car parks around the world as well. <laughs> A lot of time standing around waiting on a rally car. Yes. And then also in 2014, that was you spent some time with the Bentley racing team too as part of AM Sport. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um they developed they started developing the car in I think it must have been 2013. They started racing an Audi um R8. Mm-hmm. Just to kind of, I suppose, guess into the way of how the GT3 worked. So then in 13 I didn't really go near it. I, I done a few bits of the car in the workshop, but in 14, and they asked me to go to Monza, I think it was the first round. So we went there, and then I think it was the second round, must have been Silverstone, if I remember correctly, and we actually won the race. Okay. And then I was kind of like, you know, this is good too. <laughs> I was on the on the pit stop team. I was changing the tires. Okay. You know, a lot of high pressure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed that part of it. I'd say I'd done six, seven races okay. in 2014, 15, probably over the two seasons, mm-hmm. um, just on the pit stop crew. But that was uh, Matthew Wilson that was looking after that side of the okay. of the business, I would say. You know? uh-huh. yeah. And, so, what, and you know, uh, how did that compare to the rally? And, you know, do you get as much of a buzz out of it or maybe, you know, maybe, yeah. bit, maybe even more relaxed yeah. in a way that, you know, well, I suppose it's intense for that. You know, 10, yeah, 12 seconds yeah. for the change in the wheels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, the, the rally ends real intense, but then you have eight hours where you might not see the rally car. Uh-huh. The Bentley's going past you every two minutes on the start <laughs> finish line going, but yes. ooh, ooh, you do, you just hear it. And um, the next thing you get a call on the radio after the first corner, steering arm broken, you know, we've made contact. As uh-huh. soon as the race begins, you're, you're on the yeah, you have to wear full flame proofs, balaclava, a lot. And you could be wearing that. Some of the races 24 hours long, you know what I mean? Yes. An uh-huh. hour rings uh-huh. for 24 hours. You'd be wearing that for 24 hours. Uh-huh. Uh, well, it's tiring stuff, definitely. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, them guys have to be fit as well. Yeah. I, and the, you could, that could be, you know, you can be in the extremes of weather there too. You could be like two, three degrees yeah, yeah. or 24, 25 degrees. In that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, some, that some races, the wind's blowing through the garage. It's absolutely freezing. Some races you're in uh-huh. flame proofs. And say Australia, now we've done Bathurst a couple of times. Yes. It'll be 40 degrees and you're there in flame proofs. <laughs> Bathurst was a 12 hour race. Oh, so yeah. in 12 hours, two cars, you're pit stopping every hour. So every half an hour, you're doing a pit stop if you have two cars. Yes. You're only doing that for 12 hours. And we did, um, I remember, Spanner 24 hour, we did 49 pit stops in 24 hours. <laughs> you you just, uh, you wouldn't even know at the time because your adrenaline's going, obviously. But Yes. You're, you look at your shins the next day and you know you've been carrying 28 uh-huh. kilo rims around. You know, you carry one in each hand. So okay. They're banging off your shins. Yes. You feel it the next day. You wouldn't really feel it at the time. But no. It's, a, it's an experience, uh-huh. definitely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then also in 2015, uh, you got the opportunity, I suppose, then to come a wee bit, working a wee bit closer to home. Declan Boyle yeah, was yeah. purchased a Fiesta. One of the first yeah, that's people right. in that spec a car to... To leave yeah, and yeah. anti privateer hands, wasn't it? Yeah, because in because um, of 2015, they bought out the new car. I was kind of involved in the build of a lot of them cars. 
because uh, I'd kind of established myself on the customer team. Mm -hmm. So I ended up building uh, the car for Lorenzo Bertelli, Martin Prokop, and uh, Robert Kubica. Mm -hmm. So I built, we built the cars, but the car wasn't coming to the WRC until Rally Portugal. So I think it was, I don't know, maybe Monza or something for the Bentleys. Had the schedule given to me. I was going just the year doing the pit stops at the Bentley race. And Malcolm come down to me in the workshop and he was like, um, how do you feel about doing a few rallies in Ireland? I was like, oh, I'd love that, but how, what do you mean? Like, uh, uh, Declan Boyle's, you know, he's got an interest in buying one of these WRC cars. Mm -hmm. I was like, right, he was, would you go with it? And I was like, of course I would, you know. You know, I could stay an extra day and see my parents, you know, which yes. I was seeing once a year at the time, maybe. At that, okay. If that even, you know, Christmas uh -huh. was the only time you'd ever get to see them. Uh -huh. you know, so I jumped to that opportunity. You know. I said to Malcolm, I says, uh, what about Monza? You know, I'm meant to be going to Monza next week and he wanted me to fly to Ireland. And I was like, uh, well, he just goes, what would you pick? And I says, rallying in Ireland, obviously. <laughs> it's a no-brainer. So. Yes. No, uh, he says that's fine. So he cancelled my tickets and uh -huh. come back down about half an hour later. Tickets flying into uh, into Dublin, so right. straight over to go uh -huh. testing with Declan Boyle. Yes, uh -huh. it was and, uh, Robbie McGrath looking after the car that time. So, uh -huh. so uh, I became uh, pretty friendly with Robbie. To be fair, and uh -huh. I think I came back for most of the season. Uh -huh. um, we done Donegal Rally in 2015. Was the first time. Mm -hmm. First time he had the new car. Um, didn't really have much of a, a setup for it. He had actually gone out the night before and put the car off the road and broke the tail light and that. So mm -hmm. we come over. I had to hand carry a tail light and that in the bag. <laughs> so um, no, we got it. We got it handling pretty well on a test, but yeah. we didn't have much testing time. Um, but he ended up finished second overall. Yeah, and Gary Jennings yeah. over that year. Mm -hmm. Like, but for Declan to, you know, it was it, very brave in a way. He stepped away from his 12B, a car that he had become very comfortable with, to, you know, and mm -hmm. this was a completely different setup, wasn't it? Like, left hand drive, you know, the, the smaller engine and all that. To come away with second, like, yeah. we, we kind of overlook it. Like, that was a, it was a big step and very brave of him to do it at the time, wasn't it? You know, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I suppose he had great success in that uh, S12. I mm -hmm. suppose he was looking at it as where does he go next? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, yeah. You know, the S12 was just starting to get a bit old, I guess. But, mm -hmm. you know, he took a big risk going to the 1.6 engine. You know, everyone, you know, they're 300 horsepower on paper, but would the 1600 live with the two litres in Donegal? Mm -hmm. That was the big question, really. And he proved that they, you know, they could. Like everybody says, oh, it yeah. comes to Nogal and one thing or another, he's not going to have the same mm -hmm. power going up the hill. No. Like yeah. he matched yeah. them, you know, you know. Uh, he went toe to toe with them all, didn't he? And yeah, yeah. I think with a bit more testing time, he could have potentially been a lot closer to Gary, you know, mm -hmm. definitely. But yeah. to get in the car, you know, he, I think, he beat, I think Donna was out that day. That's there right, was yeah. a lot of two litre cars around him that day. So mm -hmm. he was able to uh, get second without much testing time. You know, it was a real good start for the car. For sure, for sure. You know, so um, mm -hmm. I actually came back and done Sligo a few weeks later with him. And we actually won Sligo. Yeah. Um, we went off from the lead in Galway Summer Rally after that. Mm -hmm. And then he went back and won the harvest the end of that year and again. So, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, um, he didn't have much luck with it since, to be honest. And yeah. uh -huh. obviously, I came over and started looking after it. I'd always kept in contact with Declan. Mm -hmm. You know, always been quite friendly with the Boyle family since, yeah. since then. And mm -hmm. he actually came over in 2016 for Donegal. Okay. Um, with Tom, he had changed from Robbie to Tom. Uh -huh. And um, that was the last rally I did with them. I just did one in 2016. And we went back to the hotel on the Friday night. We were leading the rally. Mm -hmm. um, I think he had a minute 52 lead. Yeah. And uh, it was a Friday night. Oh, no, Saturday, Saturday night. Saturday night. Saturday, yeah. Saturday, Saturday uh -huh. night. Yeah. yeah. So I just remember we were sitting down in the hotel bar to just put a point in front of me. Their uh, barman and I uh, got a text message Declan out from mm -hmm. um, it was another M Sport engineer that was actually looking after Dunna at the time. Okay, uh, I was like, Gee. you know, we would just seen him on the last stage. Oh, he passed the stage. Just, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, we we'd been to watch the last stage, so uh -huh. he um, he broke the gear linkage and pulled in. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't know, in hindsight, he was in third gear here. I think he thought the gearbox was broke. Okay. But it was just a gear linkage. We could have actually probably fixed the car and forth with it. Uh-huh. Um, probably would have meant flying back to England to get the part that night because it was a tight call. But uh-huh. I would say it, uh, it would have been done if it had to have been done, like, wouldn't it? You know, kind of exactly. Yeah, you do yeah. what you got to do at times like that. But mm-hmm. obviously, it was the only car in the country. It would have been, mm-hmm. we wouldn't have been able to just go and get one, you know what I mean, off somebody else, even yes. compared to the old Fiesta. Uh-huh. It's a total difference. She's a hydraulic. Yeah. Electric hydraulic paddle shift on that car, so mm-hmm. would have been the only one of its kind, you know. Yeah, and also then during that season, 2015, uh, Formula One uh, driver Robert Kubica was doing a lot of the World Championship events. You were working his car at yeah. the time too. Like, what an exciting yeah, driver um, Robert was. Oh, uh, yeah, still is, I, you know. So yeah, yeah and I, I learned a lot from Robert. You know, over the years, uh-huh. he's uh, he's attention to detail. Okay. And the way that man can set up a car is just blow your mind. You know, I learned learned about a lot of the stuff that I know today because of it. You know. Okay. But um, no, um, M Sport asked me to go look after Robert, so he bought the car brand new in 2015, and then um, he kind of ran the car himself. We done the first event with uh, with M Sport in Portugal, and after that, he ran the car from uh, Poland himself. So me and the engineer just used to fly out to the event, basically, run the car, fly back home. Okay. But, um, after a few events, it got a bit more difficult because we were working with um, Italian mechanics. So there was um, me, one of their M Sport contractor, and three Italian mechanics on the car. So there was a fierce language barrier, you know. Okay. But, um, yeah. After probably I don't know three, four events, we had a very good way of communicating you know you get to know these men when you're with them so much uh-huh. and um, you know by the end of it we had a real really good little tight neck team and everyone had a job and knew what they were doing so mm-hmm. that was, uh, it was definitely a good year I learned a lot that year from Robert uh-huh. um, for that man to step in a car like that after an accident he had mm-hmm. you know it's a, it was a big people didn't realize the seriousness of what that meant him stepping back into the uh, WRC car, you know. It really must have been, yeah. You, can you think about it? Like, yeah. like it, it, you know, the, he nearly lost his arm, and to step back into a rally car and go as hard as he was going, at, at the, yeah. in your head, never mind nothing else. Like, it must, you know, it must take a lot of you, really, doesn't it? You know, so, so he yeah, must be yeah. very mentally we, strong to do that. I, you know, the man's hand; he didn't have much strength in us mm-hmm. at all. Really, he drove the car. To be fair basically one-handed a lot of the time so yes. he had a lot of airplane crashes as we know but uh-huh. you know he, he had a big moment of oversteer and that you try to correct it with one hand it's not as easy as uh, yeah you know but the talent and the speed he had was just unbelievable these mm-hmm. if he had two hands i would have no doubt he would have been a world champion you know absolutely absolutely yeah mm-hmm. um, we had to make adaptions to the car as well he his paddle shift had to be moved to the other side the handbrake was a push system Oh, you know yes. the car. He got special. He got special permission off the FIA to, to do to this stuff. You know okay. to the car. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, no, it was very unique to him. All these spares would have to be unique to him. You couldn't just go get one off off yeah. M Sport. You know, you had to have a backup handbrake that worked the opposite way. Oh, of course, handle yeah. shift on the opposite side. You yeah. know, modified bracket. Uh-huh. You know, ex- a wire extend the wires. It was. Oh. It was quite a. A such a unique thing, thing yeah, to be uh-huh. yeah yeah for sure yeah uh-huh. and not easy because it didn't even though i worked for m sport i was kind of subcontracted to to robert on that so we didn't have the full work support either okay you know if we if we had a, a big service on we could go and get assistance if we needed it but yes we were just kind of thrown out on our own Mm-hmm. Look after this car. So. Yeah, you just couldn't go and lift the gearbox. If you needed it, you had to no, go and exactly. Robert, Robert had all these, uh-huh. He had all his own spares on his van. It was a yeah. sprinter van, and we used to turn up. You know, you'd, 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 at M Sport, you'd get a bit of downtime, but with Robert, you wouldn't because you'd be the one responsible for making sure he had the spare gearbox ready. Okay, sure right. the fit bike ready. Ready. Yeah. As soon as you know, you saw a bit of drama on the stage, you're building spare bumpers. And, you're constantly working, but uh-huh. uh, one of the best years ever. Just the, the things he could describe when setting up a car, and that just his attention to detail was just, oh. uh-huh. you know, a different world. Yeah, uh-huh. and the, the, like you know, to have that 
brain so analytic. Like it's not even that's not even Formula One. That's just something that he has natural ability, isn't it? You know, that's that's yeah, not something yeah, you can yeah. learn. That's just something that's in your no, your bloodstream. Uh, yeah, I think he he left school at a very young age and went karting full time, and then was kind of educated as he was racing. You know, mm-hmm. when you could tell he'd been involved in it a long time. You know, mm-hmm. he um. He definitely knew how to set a car up, that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. And there was times where, you know, we didn't see eye to eye, and there was times where, you know, we were you know, really appreciated by Robert, you know. Yeah. I remember in uh, Finland one year, we um, he absolutely barrel rolled the car in uh, one of the stages, and we went out, and it was absolutely wrecked, and we were actually testing in Germany the weekend after. So um, we actually... We crashed out on the Saturday of Finland, and then we spent the whole day on Sunday uh, stripping it in Prince Sports Workshop. Uh-huh. So we basically yeah. sent the shell back to M Sport on the Monday, completely stripped, and then by the Friday night, I was back in the truck on the way to Germany, totally fixed. You know, so we were uh-huh. testing that weekend in Germany, uh-huh. and you know, Robert appreciated it and yes. he gave us all a nice tip each as well. You know, which was good. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, just handed us a bit of cash each, you know, it was oh. nice to see. Uh, yeah, you really it shows you appreciate the effort you've done. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. He appreciated the effort of it, but, mm-hmm. you know, when things were good, they were good. When things were bad, he'd let you know, and he'd uh-huh. make sure you made it right, you know what I mean? Yes, I didn't so have the game. Like, yeah, he, it wouldn't happen again if it happened. And, you know, he would, um, he would make sure the team was right for the next day again. You know, mm-hmm. you were kind of a mechanic, you know, and a team manager as such you know the spares right. everything was organizing you know mm-hmm. yep. so okay. it kind of set me up for where i am today too i guess you know it was a real thrown in the deep end but a real learning curve as well yeah uh, it is, it's been proved invaluable as you say and yeah then, sure yeah and then in 2016 then uh tannock was back in the the m sport fold then again but with the and yeah. the, the dmite car you were helping with yeah, that then. yeah yeah um <clears throat> I've done a few rallies in a Fiesta before that, I believe, Rally GB and that. And in 2016, DMAC uh, decided they were going to enter the World Rally Championship with a tyre and enter their own car. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I got the job of looking after uh, Tanak in the 2015-16 Fiesta. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, that was a, a learning curve as well, really. Mm-hmm. He's uh, an unbelievable talent. You know, but until you get to know him, he's very abrupt. Okay. He'll tell you exactly how he wants something done. If it's not his way, <laughs> you'll know about it. You know? Yes. Okay. But, uh, you know, we, we, we became good mates towards, you know, as we progressed through the season. And, uh, uh-huh. you know, we had some real, real good results with him. And uh, running on a different tyre to everyone else isn't always the easiest thing, but there'll always be that time where it works to your advantage, too. You of course, know? yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, it wasn't easy. We were kind of outsiders again because we were on a different tire, and yeah, because you had nothing to compare it with. Then you couldn't exactly, compare it. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, yeah. We done a lot of tire testing that year as well, so you were constantly on the road as well. You know, right? Um, the tarmac tire, you turn up with a new tire that they've just developed. You may have never driven on it before. You know, okay. Um, yes. You know, you'd go do the test a couple of weeks before the rally. You'd learn from the test. Right? notes of the improvement of the tire and then mm-hmm. send it to um to d mac and then come up and land up with a tire for tarmac that you know you're arriving in monte carlo that you've never tested before okay so it was definitely a learning experience you know yes uh-huh. but, um, but like that must be fascinating uh, from your from you know from your engineering side of things to be able to provide that input to make them differences as well yeah 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 you learn a lot as well from you know, being at them tire tests and learning from the, mm-hmm. the feedback, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, it's definitely a lot different than just turning up and, you know, doing a setup on a car. You're doing a setup that's mm-hmm. for a specific tire. It's not a run of the mill setup that, you know, the rest of the M Sport team would have developed on their test. We yes, may have you, to go with something slightly different because it uh-huh. wouldn't work. Yes. With your tire, you know. So mm-hmm. uh, once again, you're, you know, we were different from the rest and we were trying different things and, mm-hmm. you know, we were kind of independent as such between me and, and the chassis engineer. You know, you'd be 
doing two or three different geometries in the workshop. You know, after the shakedown, you might change the geometry. Uh-huh. You know, a lot of extra work and little bits and pieces involved in it, you know, that people actually wouldn't see so much. Yes. But, uh, no, it was a good year. We had a, we had a near victory, which would have been the first victory for Ford since, I think, 2012. Uh-huh. Um, we were in uh, Poland 2016, so I think we went into the second last stage with 33-second lead, uh-huh. and uh, he got a puncture on the... It was the front rise, took the brake pipe out and ended up losing the rally to uh, Nicholson uh-huh. at the time. Yes. But um, you can actually see there's quite a lot of pictures around when Ogier was holding Tanak up on his shoulder. Like him up on his shoulder. Uh, uh-huh. Exactly, yeah. 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 And I suppose that kind of led on to their partnership in 2017 then before. Yeah. But, uh-huh. you know, they, they developed a good relationship then. And, uh-huh. you know, we didn't win, win the rally that day, but... Everyone he, knew that uh, he, he, was a, he, uh, he was a deserving one and really wasn't he? You know? yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, uh-huh. He was robbed of it, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, but I, I think he finished second in the end still, but... Yeah. You know, but to, to, gain, stages, but no to, uh, and to gain the respect of Oje, who, you know, exactly, yeah. was out there to grab every point for himself, you know, for Oje to do that, like, was unbelievable, wasn't it? Really, you know, that was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It shows the mark yeah, of Oje no, as uh, well, as much as Tanak, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, good sportsmanship as well, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I think he could see the potential in Tanak, and mm-hmm. I suppose this was at the early days of his speed that he now has, you know, as well. He's, uh, mm-hmm. he's won a world title, obviously, since, but he yeah. can definitely challenge the mm-hmm. top boys, you know. Yeah. He has uh, and the place to do it, just needs to look on the day. Mm-hmm. And, you know... As much as anything else in, in a rally car, I think confidence is a, a huge part of it. And, you know, for him that day, his confidence was up at, a, you know, maybe a whole new level for him. And it maybe showed him, I, I know I deserve to be here. I can do this, you know. And for Roger then to, it must have lifted his confidence even more again then, you know, that show of confidence yeah, from Roger yeah. as well too, isn't it? You know, so. Yeah, yeah, I think we've seen that into 2017. He was straight on the... Mm-hmm. On the attack with Ford, you know, mm-hmm. they won three at yeah. uh, Monte Carlo 17. So, right. he, um, no, he's definitely a serious talent. Yeah. And going into 17, that's, you know, these brand new regulations, you know, these new cars, like, like it must have been like such an exciting time. Like, these cars, you know, yeah. we've seen now in the last few years, like, there'll probably never be anything like it. I saying that maybe these new cars in six months' time will be every bit as spectacular. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this yeah. was way, such a huge step from what we'd seen to, you know, from yeah. the end of 16 into 17. They're like spaceships almost, you know, these big wings, aero, yeah, yeah, such yeah. a huge yeah. part of it. Yeah. Like, what was that like for you? Now, to... right, you still see it now and you think, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, even if you look back at yeah. 15 car, if you see one now. But, uh-huh. you know, um, I remember when we were building them, putting all these carbon bumpers together and... <laughs> In the front bumpers 52 pieces of carbon individually you know and no it's uh it was definitely a major change in regulation but uh-huh. what what a car and i don't think we'll see anything like that again i don't know it's like the uh-huh. the modern day group b cars i guess but oh, sure. Oh, sure. you know oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure from what we're seeing of the new cars they'll be uh-huh. just as spectacular but i oh, think sure. uh-huh. you know aero wise and everything will it ever be as spectacular as 17 I don't know. No. And like, you know, for you to be there, you know, whenever you've seen the first drone of that, were you still going looking, how is this ever going to work, you know, like compared to what we'd seen previous to, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, um even the development car, you know, it was M Sport always kind of start off with a mule car and it was the 15, 16 car, you know, and they started adapting all this aero onto it, and you see it slowly change. Uh-huh. changing and uh, transforming into the new car and yeah. as usual before Monte Carlo it's always a lot of late nights trying to get the cars ready and uh-huh. I think it must have been about half one in the morning by the time we got Elvin's car onto the right. onto the truck ready to go you know <laughs> um, I usually drove the truck to the rallies but we would work that many hours that uh-huh. I couldn't even drive the truck you know so uh-huh. someone else had to take it but uh, no it was a uh, a lot of takeaways and that on the <laughs> counter and in sport. Yes. And, the, weeks, and, you know, just, uh, and to get Sebastian Ogier to come to the team that year as well, like what yeah. how, what kind of lift did that give them whenever you hear that? Like that how many yeah, just massive, the coming? Uh-huh. yeah, like, you know, I guess you could say 
you know, they hadn't won a rally since 2012. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of monotonous. We were just kind of turning up and being close, but not not getting victories. And mm -hmm. to be have a driver line up with Ogier, Tanak, and Evans mm -hmm. definitely lifted the whole place massively. You know. Yes. And mm -hmm. those, but it put a lot of pressure on at the same time too, because you can't mm -hmm. have a world champion turn up and give him something yeah. that's not capable of uh, producing the goods. You know. Mm -hmm. No. Um, no, it was really good. Uh, OJ made, he come to the test, he made a lot of good development to the car. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, everything was stepped up to another level. Yeah. Even the service equipment, service area, everything was spruced up. And that was because of him, you know. He, um, mm -hmm. he didn't let anything go without being seen. He picked up on every little detail. You know, you could see why he was the world champion. You know, little bolts, if there were two, three threads too long. <laughs> He'd ask you, why is that there? You know, you have to cut it back flush and, yeah. you know, carrying this extra weight for nothing and just uh, a different level. Oh, isn't that uh, crazy, you know, when you think of it? But that's the, that's the difference, isn't it? You know, that's, you know, that's... Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that's the difference between world champion and being not being a world champion, isn't it? Really? Exactly, you know, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't think, but I guess all them little things add up. But mm -hmm. his attention to detail, just until you've actually worked with him, you wouldn't... Yeah. You wouldn't believe his attention to detail and the unseen effort that goes in as well, I guess, you know, yeah. even Julian, you know, one of the nicest guys I've ever met in WRC, he would have the time uh -huh. to come and have a chat with you in the mornings and that, but what a professional, you know, uh -huh. everything he done, you know, they would spot things on a recce that no one else would spot, Yes, you know, spot things on a test, you know, mm -hmm. little detail inside the car was just, you know, they took it to a whole other level. I, like, uh, I was listening to Bex's podcast with Julian there and saying, you know, about after the first test, he, he, he produced like a five page report for M Sport. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. They had never seen nothing like this before, you know. So, as you say, it's just yeah. the wee things like that that just make the difference, I suppose, really, at the end of it all. Yeah, there was mm -hmm. just no room for a mistake, just everything had to be right. Mm -hmm. Pressure was on before Monty 17 for sure. Mm -hmm. And as you say, on the rally. and like as you say, he come and spoke to you even before you know it started every morning. But like, to, yeah, yeah, that would make you want to perform too because this guy appreciated you being there. So mm -hmm. you want that extra mile then to to do yeah, your best exactly. for him too, yeah. don't you? you know, so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just an absolute legend, Julian. Is every morning he would come up, uh -huh. you know, and he would shake your hand, and he wouldn't just shake your hand and disappear. He would say, you know, what did you go out for dinner last night? Where'd you eat? Or, you know, he'd really, you know, take his time. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, you'd want to produce the goods for that man, you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, he became a friend in the sport. and mm -hmm. He wasn't just, uh, you know, a co-driver, you know, you see over the years. Don't get me wrong, they're all brilliant and they all respect mm -hmm. you. And Julian, he just went to a different level, you know? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And then, you know, like uh, that year, like, a dream for M Sport really wasn't it? Like to be part of that, you know, yeah. as you say, going from 2012 without a one to all of a sudden being, you know, the team. Yeah, yeah. No, the at the start of 17, the car was really, really good, and it took a while for the opposition, I guess, to catch up. You know, mm -hmm. um, they were getting closer all the time, but M Sport were still developing and. You know, 17 was just one of them years that he'd look back on for a long time and, you know, you wouldn't change it for the world. You know, uh, mm -hmm. when we won um, Rally GB with Elvin, his home yeah. rally, and we were standing up on the roof of that car as, you know, on that day in Wales, yeah. home rally, Victor, we won their, their uh, manufacturers and the driver's titles. Uh -huh. yeah. I think all in the, your yeah. home country. Yeah. I'm sports home country, I should say, really. But uh -huh. you know, I think you know, Hollywood just, couldn't have wrote a better story. Like Elvin no. crossed the line, won on his home rally, you know, in front of exactly. his own people. Uh, yeah. Tannock followed him across the line, manufacturers, manufacturers title, you know, yeah. and yeah. then yeah. uh, OJ's next okay, across. Yeah, <laughs> you know, oh, have, you, have just, you seen it in a film? You wouldn't have believed it, would you? You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. no, you just you couldn't have wrote the script any better. It's uh -huh. just yeah. Like it will never ever happen again. I would imagine that oh, mm -hmm. the home man will win his first WRC event. Mm -hmm. You know, the home team will secure manufacturers, yeah. and they'll also secure their first drivers' title, and all do it mm -hmm. all on the same day. 
yes. in their own country, you know, you just mm-hmm. not going to see it again. I don't think all the stars will align again mm-hmm. for that, even, you know, and the, you looks know, good for next year, but uh-huh. I can't see it all aligning like that. Anyway. So, so, uh, but, you know, we, we do, you, you spoke there about like Evans won this first uh, World Championship event then GB. It, it comes so mm-hmm. close to a few months earlier in Argentina. And they, yeah. it kept the bridge in the last stage or whatever, and it lost out by 0.7 of a second. But maybe it was written in the stars that, that you know, that, that it wasn't meant to be. It was meant to be GB, you know? So. Yeah, yeah, you know, that heartache in Argentina made yeah. GB even more special. Yes. Okay, I'm sure, you know, Elvin wanted his first win. You know, we uh-huh. wanted our first win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, DMAC wanted their first win. Everybody wanted their first win. Uh-huh. You know, in Argentina, it was hard to take seven tenths of a second. I think it was... Yeah. I know at the time third closest WRC finish in history, and mm-hmm. so um, that event definitely wasn't simple. Um, I think Alvin was leading the event on the Friday night, okay. about fifty-two seconds, I think. Right. Uh, I don't. We had a forty-five flexi service in the car, and uh, about ten minutes to go. You know, the last job always bleak the brakes. You know, um, Alvin. You know, he always demanded that his brakes be bled. Was kind of a run of the mill job, you know. We do it very regular, so we were just bleeding the brakes. I was pumping the pedal and just nothing. The engineers were telling me there's air in it. I was like, there's, there's no air in it. You know, we're not getting any air. There's no pedal. I said, the seals are gone in the cylinder. Uh-huh. How can the seals be gone? And I said, no, this, I'm telling you now, the seals are gone. Right. So, pumped 10 minutes, we could achieve nothing. <laughs> so um, we made the decision to take the car to the park for a minute with no brakes. Okay. So we took it on the Friday night with no brakes, the park for a minute, with a lead of 52 seconds in a rally. <laughs> so, um, you know, that was probably one of the longest nights of my life. Yes. Uh, we went back, we had a bit of a meeting about it. Um, all the engineers, Brembo engineers, everybody uh-huh. had a look through the data. And sure enough, there were seals gone in the, in the front end. A little bit in the rear cylinder, but the front cylinder had completely failed. Uh-huh. So, um, so uh, basically, we had to make a decision of do we try and fix this in a 15 minute service the next morning? Uh-huh. Because we were leading the rally, we had no choice. We just we had to do it. Like retiring wasn't an option. So, okay. Um, well, Malcolm pulled me to the side and he says, Right, we need to practice this. I says right, so I got a pedal box and all on the bench, and he says no, we need to, we need to actually bolt this down and represent it what it would be like in the rally car. Uh-huh. We bolted it to the far side of this big metal bench, and uh, he actually made me lean over the bench, <laughs> so I was at full reach just to replicate like leaning over the door bars in the rally car. Yes, and he stayed with me for a couple of hours until I could get it down to under ten minutes. <laughs> So we uh-huh. ended up modifying spanners and that and you know, uh-huh. shaving them down to get them thinner so they'd go onto the onto the connectors a bit easier. And I think we got it down to seven minutes on the bench <laughs> to do a change of the cylinders. Yes. But obviously the next morning we had to bleed the brakes also. Uh-huh. We also uh-huh. had to change the calipers and the handbrake as well. So um no, it was kind of a mental job, but uh-huh. then we done it in nine minutes the next morning. And uh, we managed to get the brakes bled, uh-huh. um, change the rear calipers, and change the handbrake. Car left service, and we even took two calipers in the car just in case. <laughs> and uh, about 10 litres of brake fluid for Elvin to change if the problem came back. Yeah. So, um, no, unfortunately, the problem did come back on the Sunday. Okay. Uh, we flushed out all the fluid, but we uh-huh. still to this day, we don't, we don't know what caused it to okay. this day, but... Uh-huh. Uh, fluid must have been contaminated or something. Right. So, yes. Um, he lost the brakes actually on the Sunday, and when I collected the car from the park, the park for me after he hit the bridge on the on the power stage, you know, uh-huh. I don't know. I only lost the rally by seven tenths of a second because yeah. the pedal was just going to the floor. Right. A complete soft pedal again, but uh-huh. you know, to go from a fifty-two second lead to losing a rally by seven tenths of a second. Uh-huh. You know, if the rally was a, if the rally was a kilometer shorter, we probably would own it. Yes, but there's a, a kilometer longer. He may, uh, you know, may never even finished. You know, too. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh-huh. They hit that iconic bridge as well. You know, yes, <laughs> the Indiana Jones bridge. I think it was. <laughs> um, it was in the movie Indiana Jones. So uh-huh. see him hitting that and then lose the rally. 
Oh, yeah. I, say, I guess it made GB all the more special that day. But uh-huh. yeah, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, at least he won us in front of his whole family and everyone there and his home crowd. So yes, it would have been uh-huh. a, not the same, I guess, winning it in Argentina, but yeah. you know, very hard to take at the time. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah, and then for 2018, then like at Red Bull become more involved with the team and all. Tannock had moved on to Toyota and it was yeah. uh, OJ and Evans then stepped up to be the second driver and Timo Sundin yeah. and then and the, another Sundin, fantastic yeah. year another fantastic year for, for OJ another title yeah another title uh, I wouldn't say it was as plain sailing as 2017 the opposition had got a bit closer to us but mm-hmm. OJ you know he's a complete champion he just pulled it out the bag again the car mm-hmm. was still a very competitive and you know, I still believe the car is still, you know, a very good car, you know. Yes. Um, obviously, they've concentrated their development towards the newer car now, but mm-hmm. the car is still very good, especially on the tarmac, you know, and um, oh, he pulled the win out the bag again and crossed mm-hmm. the line in Australia. We actually all went down to the to the last stage and seen him come around the last corner to, uh, to win his um, mm-hmm. world title again, which is something never forget. And then we, we had a podium at the end of the power stage it was just mm-hmm. a good year I think I don't know I think in the two years we had like 20 21 podiums mm-hmm. in um, 2017-18 so yeah no it was definitely a, a good year 2017-18 and uh-huh. with Red Bull you know we, we were back at the top you know Volkswagen had left you know M Sport now had Red Bull had OJ we were mm-hmm. the world champions you know yeah it was just uh some of the years you'd never forget, you know. Yeah, like we're, you know, we're, going, we're going to look back now in ten years' time, and that is going to be another golden era of rallying, isn't it? You know these, yeah. You know, as you say, almost Group B type monsters. You know, like I do. You know, I do think this is going to be a, a very special time when we look back, and it must be for you to look be able to look back and say, I think it's part of that. You know, it must be a, a lovely filler in your cap too. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, have some of the photos here and that from them days when we won rallies and you don't really look at them, uh-huh. you know, think very much of them at the minute. But I guess in 10, 20 years, when you look back at it, mm-hmm. you know, it's going to be like now looking back on the Group B days and, That's it. Uh-huh. you know, some very big names in rallying and, mm-hmm. you know, big sponsors, world championships. Yeah. And I was definitely something very proud to be a part of, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. And like, you know, you, you looked to earlier there, you know, Julian, being the consummate, consummate professional that he is, you know, took you out and, you know, that after one in, in uh, Australia and took you out and took you in the helicopter tour, wasn't it, no, around Sydney? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he, we actually went to the, the gala. There's like a gala in Sydney. Oh, right, yes. At the end of, at the end of uh, each season. So we went in 2017 and 2018, me and a, Few of the mechanics, Rich Milner, you know, the press officer, there was mm-hmm. I don't know, a group of uh, 12 of us maybe went to the gallery at the end of the year from Esport, you know, mm-hmm. tuxedos, the full works, you know, real glamour. And yes, um, we were just there. And Julian says, What are you doing tomorrow? And I was like, Don't really know. We're, we're in Sydney for a couple of weeks. We're just going to take each day as it comes, you know. Uh-huh. He says, um, He gave us an address and just says, Come here in the morning at eight o'clock. We were thinking, geez, I don't know, will they be up at 8 o'clock? Because they'll trust me, you want to come. So uh, sure enough, me and one of the other mechanics, um, it was with me there, he, we got up, we got on the tube and we went down to uh, this address and sure enough, it was a helicopter waiting for us. It was actually the, it's actually the WRC helicopter that they use for chasing uh, the cars the day before at the rally. Uh-huh. You know? it was the WRC pilot and all, and uh, Julian had spoke to him that day and arranged this trip for us, so. You know, basically, we had this helicopter for the day in Sydney and go wherever we want. Uh-huh. Uh, we went up nearly all the way back up to Coffs Harbour again, actually, and took us to this uh, golf course and big vineyards and just had the most unbelievable deal you could ever think of, you know, just yeah. Michelin star and uh-huh. really looked after us, you know, yeah. and then took us back down through yeah. Sydney, mm-hmm. flying around the Opera House, you know, Harbour Bridge. Just you know, what a guy he just mm-hmm. you wouldn't expect that from anybody, but that's how much he, he put back into it, you know. He yeah. appreciated what we done for him. Yeah. And the, at this stage they were already leaving, weren't they? Like so 
you know, it wasn't that, you know, it was that, oh, yeah. that's a lift the guys for next year or whatever. They were, yeah, they, yeah. they'd already announced they were back, going back to Citroen again at that yeah. point. Yeah, 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 for sure. And, you know, if I seen him now, he would still chat away to me. You know, yeah. he's just a genuine guy. But, uh-huh. um, no, even that guy, you know, we used to have these big chalets in, uh, in Alley, Australia. And he'd rather be there playing cards and drinking and messing about with us, with the mechanics, uh-huh. than he would be out having a meal with the rest of them, you know. So. Right. Uh-huh. He was he, even to the day he left. He was there partying with us uh-huh. right till the end. You know, he yes. uh, he much prefer to hang around with the mechanics and be a part of the team, and mm-hmm. then you know do the you know yeah. the media and oh, going out for it. meals. With, you know, mm-hmm. Yeah, the sponsors. You know, and all he, this kind uh, of he just wanted to be exactly. Yeah, he just wanted to be one of the lads, and mm-hmm. once he took off that helmet, that was it. He was. Uh, uh-huh. Just one of the guys, you know, but a pro- total professional when he put it on. But yeah. you know, he uh, he enjoyed himself as well when uh, yeah. when the he was right in the car. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, always the, the last round of the season, you know, seventeen, eighteen. Mm-hmm. You know, we've drew some great photos and some great memories of them in times too. Yeah, absolutely. And like, also at this point, you'd kind of decided, you no, know, it was time for you maybe to take a, to take a wee step back, and you decided you want to go move near home and set up in your own yeah was it just yeah. you know, um, that been constantly away from home all the time that was i suppose yeah. that's okay for a few years but you can't do it forever can you so. yeah yeah as i said before it's you know people see the glamour side of it and there is a glamour side to it but there's a lot of days there isn't that much glamour a lot of long hours in airports mm-hmm. you know i think probably spending 250 nights of a year in a hotel room you know so mm-hmm. i don't think it's something you could do forever um, I'd always my plan always had been before I ever went to M Sport was, you know, I wanted to run my own rally team. You know, that was always the the goal at the end of it. I would say, but mm-hmm. uh, 2018 we'd won another title with M Sport. You know, unless I went deeply down the engineering side of things towards engine engineering and that etc. But you know, for me it was time to maybe. I can move back home and do my own thing, but mm-hmm. I'd kept in touch with um, the likes of Declan Boyle and that, you know, and mm-hmm. you know, he, um, he decided that, you know, if I came back, that he would let me look after the cars for him. So okay. uh, there was nothing else to really achieve. You know, 2019, it was the same car again. Okay. You know, we don't have the new regulations again until 22. Mm-hmm. You know, the learning had kind of stopped. We kind of, you know, had kind of achieved what I wanted to achieve out of it. So mm-hmm. moved back to um, to Donegal and started running Declan Boyle's cars. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, uh, we started the 2019 season, first round Galway. Got the cars ready over the Christmas, rebuilt the cars and was ready to go for Galway in 2019. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, um, to come back... And I think Declan got his eyes opened how methodical you were. Like, you know, the, the world car was completely struck down. Every last yeah. nut and bolt was taken out of the car. And it was basically a new car the time you'd finished with it. Yeah, um, I don't think he was expecting it to go to that extent. But uh-huh. he came in one day, like I'd only been there, I don't know, a week maybe, and there was just a floor pan and a cage sitting in the workshop. <laughs> the rest of it had been cut away. And, that, um, you know, it had a few hits and that was a bit of filler in places and uh-huh. my mind was we get it back to its full glory and get a lot of weight out of it okay i think we actually got nearly got to 90 kilos out of the car by the time it was rebuilt uh-huh. you know, and uh, yes. we've done a, a lot of work on setup wise and mm-hmm. you know could hopefully give him a tool that was able to win rallies you know yes uh-huh. and so, uh-huh. Unlike, it, 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 it also surprised yeah and at that stage, it also got an R5, which probably fair to say it didn't really take to too well. But like even then, no. Donante, like Donegal, like phenomenal mm-hmm. performance against you know Craig Breen and Sam Moffat, you know, leading yeah, at the end yeah. of the first day. Like mm-hmm. I'm sure Declan won't mind me saying, but you know, he's he's not as young as the other two guys. Craig Breen, mm-hmm. we know how good he is. <laughs> you know, he's yeah. he's going to be part of the M Sport team next year. To be, you know. To yeah. be up there competing, never mind leading them two guys, was an outstanding performance, really, wasn't it? You know, so. Yeah, we we put a lot of testing time in, and we'd done a, every rally kind of leading up to Donegal. As you know yourself, 
every everything around Donegal is aimed at Donegal. Towards rally. Donegal. Yeah. <laughs> every, every rally was kind of a test towards Donegal. So uh-huh. we were developing the setup throughout the season, you mm-hmm. know, to climax with yes. the engine rebuilt before Donegal. We had everything aligned so that mm-hmm. we'd go on to Donegal with our, you know, at our full potential. Yes. So, um, yeah, we got the engine rebuilt. I think we'd done one rally, which may have been maybe the Circuit of Monster before. Mm-hmm. Donegal as a bit of a test with the new engine just to make sure we had no teething issues or anything. So okay. everything kind of was aimed at, you know, max attack for Donegal. Uh-huh. Um, I suppose that was kind of the re- main reason that I went there to look after the car too. You know, mm-hmm. he wanted to win Donegal. It was the thing that meant the most to him, you know? Yeah, the Holy Grail almost. Uh, in the yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he had a very good first day in Donegal, leading the rally. I think, I think the gap was nine tenths or something at the end of yeah, day one. It was not yeah, really yeah, real, good, <laughs> real good fight, you know. But <laughs> the stages on Friday were kind of, it could have been anywhere, you know what I mean? Whereas if we would have got into Saturday and got onto the roads that he knew, mm-hmm. I'm sure we would have, you know tried to pull away but hopefully that was the plan anyway to kind of we didn't mm-hmm. actually expect to be where we were on Friday it just kind of ended up there which was uh-huh. a pleasant surprise yeah. but you know yeah. we were really aiming at making um, our mark on Saturday you know okay. when we got to Alcala and that etc but mm-hmm. you know, the Saturday didn't go as we planned yes <laughs> so I, think, I think the first stage was cancelled and then we lost yes. uh, 28 with a puncture on the second stage uh-huh. And uh, I was like a red cloth to a bull, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it was all or nothing then, you know. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, mm-hmm. you know, he went off, made a small mistake, and he paid a heavy price for it. The car yeah. was completely uh, destroyed, really. So, mm-hmm. and like you know, to start again, though, that like, there must be a huge work to you know start stripping it all down and rebuild it back to the way it was again. Like, is that something you enjoy getting, you know, getting back and you know stripping it back to what it was and yeah, yeah, yeah. Make it yeah, all come yeah. together. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I'd had my fair share of experiences with Kubitzer and that in 16 yes. and Tanak. Yeah, uh, Kubitzer in 15, Tanak at 16. You know, I'd had a lot of re- big rebuilds in short periods of time. So, yes. So, we uh, we actually were going to go to, I think it was Sligo was on the weekend after or two weekends after. Yeah, a few weeks on that. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we were, we were aiming to be in Sligo, no different, you know. Uh-huh. Um, we, I think by the Sunday we had the roof and everything cut off the car. We were fully, full steam ahead to get it fixed. You know, uh-huh. obviously things didn't work out as to plan, but yes, um, with COVID and that, Aye. car was rebuilt and it just mm-hmm. kind of sat there ever since. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you know, like for Dick and them to come back for the harvest there a few weeks ago here in Donegal, and like mm-hmm. to step back and. For a man that hadn't sat in like a rally car for basically what a year and a half, mm. and to step in and go as hard as he did against yeah, guys, yeah. you know, the likes of the Moffats and these guys and Divine that who had been had done four, five, six rallies up to that point, mm-hmm. you know, unbelievable yeah. again, you know. So yes, it's a world yeah, car, yeah. cars and R5, but mm-hmm. the, the, they weren't huge power stages either. You know, it was it was technically yeah, about yeah, yeah. technical and stages was, as well, yeah. weren't they? You know, so. Yeah, very muddy, wet conditions too. So mm-hmm. would have really suited the lesser power R five car as well, you know. So mm-hmm. no, um, it was we weren't we weren't really going originally. It was going in a polo, uh, mm-hmm. renting a polo. So we actually just done a test. He texted me. We went down. We done a test just to get him back in the seat of of a rally car. Oh, uh-huh. You know, there was no plan to go in the WRC car. Right. It was just the only car that was sitting there ready to go. Mm-hmm. To a certain extent, you know, in hindsight, if we knew we were going, we would have done a lot more prep on the car. Mm-hmm. You know, the brakes, you know, everything had been parked up for two years, a bit of the electrics, you know, starting to fail towards the end of the rally. He lost the paddle shift and stuff like that on the car. So uh-huh. um, he didn't even launch. He had no launch for the last loop either, you know. Right. And the centre console in the car had uh, given up. Just, I guess, maybe a bit of moisture in it for sitting about for two years doing okay. nothing, you know. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. But no, we got we went for a test, and I think it was the Thursday before the harvest rally. Uh-huh. Um, I needed a few parts for the car, so we were waiting for them. We went out on the Thursday. It was a wet morning in Donegal. I went out, and uh, 
kind of just had a set up on it the way it ran before Donegal mm-hmm. um, internationally you know so we went out and the car ran perfectly on the day and got a text off Declan later and he just says uh, just take that car back to the workshop just in case and I was like oh no what's going to happen here and <laughs> this was the Thursday night <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no, so uh, sure enough I got the call Thursday night that uh-huh. We're gonna go in the world car. He just, you know, because he'd been out the car for so long, and yes, you know, I guess it was kind of a comfort to go in something that he knows rather than something that he didn't know. Uh-huh. Um, you know, he for sure he didn't think he'd be able to do what he did, and mm-hmm. after he was nearly two and a half years, I guess, out of the car, but you know, he was straight back on the pace. Yeah, I think he was like three seconds after stage one, which is, mm-hmm. you know, remarkable, really. That is for sure, for sure. And also then, you know, a wee bit closer to your workshop there now, uh, Patrick O'Brien, you know, like mm-hmm. a young guy that we, I think, you know, anybody who didn't know the talent they had, I think the Bushwhacker highlighted that for a lot of people, didn't it? You know, yeah, he, uh, it was phenomenal performance they put in there, wasn't it, him and the brother? Yeah, he's a, he's a super talent to be fair to him. Um, I'm very got very friendly with the O'Briens and that since I moved up here so mm-hmm. um, you know they were a big part of me probably coming up here as well you know and had me out a lot back then and during COVID and that and um, just kind of had he got this opportunity through his sponsors always wanted to do the Bushwhacker in an R5 he hadn't had much luck really I guess he had the pace in the Evo but never really had the luck to go with it but mm-hmm. we got a we managed to hire a car so I went on board with it and we did a uh, day's testing on the, I think it was the Friday before the rally. Mm-hmm. We finally got the car yeah. where we needed it and went out testing. And then um, no, he just pulled it out of the bag. He, unbelievable drive, really. Uh, mm-hmm. I'd say he could, you know, he could go far if he had the budget and the sponsorship to do so. But, mm-hmm. you know, that's not easy to get. But no, unfortunately not. The sponsorship for that rally and he was able to produce the goods. So yeah. hopefully, you know, he can do a bit of work and a bit of sponsorship and get out in it again, you know. Mm-hmm. And like for anybody that hasn't seen that in car from the Bushwhacker, you know, it's it's oh, <laughs> yeah. it's scary in places, but like you know, the, the commitment, you know, um, as an as a Craig Breen always talks about throwing your balls up on the dashboard, like <laughs> Patrick definitely had them up on the dashboard that day, didn't he? You know, so. yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, um, I, the work that he puts in behind the scenes is something that I haven't witnessed in it, you know, since WRC days, he, mm-hmm. the detail in the notes, the detail they put into the videos, you know, of the recce, you know, mm-hmm. even Steve and his co-driver, the effort they put in is just second to none, you know, yeah. if they get it right on the day, they'll be hard to compete with because they're that prepared, you know. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, they want the, to also... The and, work is massive. Uh, and the Ulster probably, you know, was a, an unfair reflection on their town, you know, the, the car just seemed to, yeah. it just didn't, just, just didn't work on the day, did it really? You know, there'd be issues with the car yeah, all day, no. more or less, you know, so, yeah. So, yeah, yeah this is the problem when you hire cars too, you don't know really what you're getting and you get the car a couple of days before the rally. And, mm-hmm. You know, we, um, we had a few teething issues with it. We lost the steering rack, we had a misfire. Mm-hmm. Eventually the pop-off valve failed on the car, you know, Everything went wrong on the day that could have gone wrong. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, hopefully he gets another opportunity. And yeah. for sure, that his tarmac experience wouldn't be as great as his gravel. But mm-hmm. I've been in the car with him on tarmac. And, you know, if he gets it right on the day, he'll be up there. There'll be, there'll be something there. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. For sure. And looking forward now to 2022, um, is the, your books filling up well for 2022? You're excited for the new season? Yeah, um, you know, there's a few customers talking about doing rallies next year. Obviously, it's hard to know until we see what's going to happen with, uh-huh. you know, COVID and everything. Hopefully, everything stays as planned. But uh-huh. The calendar was released there, so there's plenty of people talking, and we should see the boils out for most of the season anyway. I will uh-huh. so. Yes. And, um, probably see Michael out again, and. Maybe even Matthew might make an appearance. You know, the younger son yes. is now um, uh-huh. at the age where he could be uh-huh. getting Look the car. So yes. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, we'll see him at some point during the season. So, Brilliant. no, um, we're in talks with a few people here. So, 
Uh-huh. Looking at doing the forestry, national, Irish, and maybe some BRC rounds. So oh, hopefully it goes ahead. Yes. You know, uh-huh. the plan, but it's yes. early days. Yes, we'll see what it brings in the, I suppose, after Christmas. Hopefully the phone will start ringing, people looking uh-huh. for the Galway, but it won't be long won't be long coming. No, that's for sure. That's for sure. Uh, right. So well, that's, you know, we'll have a wee quick fire round here just to finish it all off. Um, mm-hmm. Once again, really appreciate you taking the time here. But, no so, worries. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. No problem. So we'll go with this then. Your all time favourite rally car. Oh, <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be rude if I didn't say the 2017 Fiesta WRC. <laughs> um, no, uh, you know, 99. Brett's the S5, S6, you know, that's probably yes. my favourite car of all time. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, the, um, the one car you haven't worked on yet that you would love to, you know, be involved in? Um, I'd like to get a um, hands on that Toyota, um, the 2017 Toyota, actually. Uh, yeah. There was one point I could have gone down that path of going that route, but uh-huh. I'd, not, uh, I'd like to get my hands on that. Um, you know, the, the Volkswagen from the OJ era would be a mm-hmm. nice car to, you know, I'd like to see how they went about uh, their suspension and stuff. That year would be a nice, mm-hmm. nice bit of learning in that, yeah. I would imagine. One driver you'd love to work from, from any era? Well, probably Colin McRae, I would say. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think he'd be the easiest to work with, but... Okay. Definitely, he's uh, probably one of the heroes I would look back on. And he was just, you know, it was all or nothing. Mm-hmm. As well as I liked his attitude, the way he uh, went about things. Yes. <laughs> and what's been the best roadside fix you've seen it, like a crew com- complete, you know, to keep them in the rally or to keep them moving or whatever? Uh, seen a few, to be fair. Um, <laughs> OJ did a very impressive fix in Turkey with a ratchet strap. You know, um, but the best one I've seen was probably Elvin Evans. I think it was 2015. Rear A arm snapped, and uh, you know, no one else would have bought the car back. But he got a spanner out of the toolkit, two Jubilee clips, and joined it up with the spanner. And, oh, unbelievable! Uh-huh. Car drove back to service. <laughs> we did not know until we seen this how the hell he had done it. But no, it was impressive. But uh-huh. oh, very mechanically minded, and yes. You know, it didn't even take him too much time to think of the fix. He had the spanner actually yeah. beat into the A arm, so it was actually inside the tube. Yeah. And then that didn't really work, so he put another spanner on the outside and two Jubilee clips around it. Uh, got him back to service, so yeah, Brilliant. fairly impressive. Yes. <laughs> Your favourite rally to work on? Uh, uh, I would say Mexico. Mm-hmm. You know, just it just has a bit of everything. Yes. You know, a nice, it had nice hotels, it had a fantastic service park, you know, there was a lot of activity there with the spectators, uh, had the weather, you know, stages, had a good schedule, everything about it, you know, good food, good nightlife, you know, definitely had everything, ticked all the boxes. Yeah. And then to finally, your proudest day, you know, in your rallying career up to this point? Um... It's hard to say because definitely 2017, you know, winning the home rally with Elvin, sitting on the roof of that car with him has to be the proudest day. But mm-hmm. for me personally, winning rallies with my team is, you know, just a bigger a bigger thing for me. You know, we won mm-hmm. the, the Bushwhacker there with Paddy, you know, means a lot. And I'm sure with Declan Boyle, we still have plenty of days to come. That, mm-hmm. You know, we're going to make good memories too, you know. Excellent. Thank you. Well, Adam, really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it's been such a, no a joy listening to the story. So thank you very much. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully I didn't bore you too much. Not a bit, not a bit. <laughs> that was Adam Platt and myself, Kevin Goodlanen, talking rallying. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, can you please like and share it across all social media platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, etc. It would be gratefully appreciated. Also on YouTube and on my own website, The Crunching Gears, Podbean account. There's the whole bike catalogue. There's some fascinating stories there. So until the next time, take care, speak soon, and bye.